Hello, thank you for joining us. This is Platform. I'm Ruth Aguele. The past days has been a trying moment for the country. As a result of the nationwide protests which began on August 1, which has created tension in some parts of the country. Although security operatives have stepped in to curtail the situation where necessary. However, there are still calls for concern on the need for dialogue, which has been the stance of the federal government even before now. We've seen different groups lend their voices on peace building from civil society groups, religious bodies, community leaders, as part of efforts to down tensions. For a country like Nigeria, with sections of agitations, expression of grievances, and moves taken to drive home the point, the role of peace building efforts becomes mandatory, which stakeholders say, if not taken seriously, can hinder progress and stability of the country. No doubt, effective peace building can only be achieved through collective efforts from both the governed and the government at all levels by promoting dialogue, which is one surest way of promoting stability and reconciliation. However, the process of peace building and conflict resolution is not without its challenges, especially when one party is not ready to negotiate. Experts say this is not the time to create room for anarchy, but in defiance, we must stand united to protect our democracy and one sure way is by negotiating peaceful nation building. It is possible to lay the foundations for a more stable and prosperous future for all citizens if only all parties agree to negotiate peace on the table. On platform, our focus is negotiating peaceful nation building and our guest is Reverend John Hayab, Country Director, Global Peace Foundation, Nigeria. Thank you for joining us, Reverend. Thank you for having me and my felicitations to all Nigerians. Indeed. And uh, let's let you in on who he is, talking about his profile more. Um, Reverend Hayab John Joseph is a graduate of Baptist Theological Seminary, Kaduna, and have been a member of many interreligious committee for about 25 years, now working with local faith leaders in northern Nigeria to promote religious tolerance and understanding. Reverend Hayab is the immediate past chairman, Christian Association of Nigeria, that is CAN, Kaduna State Chapter, and immediate past vice chairman, CAN, 19 northern states working with other Christian faith leaders to promote ecumenism amongst Christian faithfuls. He is board of trustees, chairman for Women Interfaith Council. He has been facilitating for the side-by-side -side movement for gender justice in Nigeria and is the coordinator of Faith Actors Dialogue from Kaduna State, a forum of religious leaders speaking out for peace and taking collective action for Adolescent Girls Initiative. Reverend Hayab is an alumni of International Visitors Leadership on Interfaith Leadership and Human Rights. Now you know him much better. Uh, we'll bring in our panelists now, uh, one of our regular, Kenneth Inanim. Kenneth, thank you so much for joining us on platform. Thank you, Ruth. It's my pleasure to be here and welcome our guest, Reverend Yahab. Thank you very much, Kenneth. And I must say, Kenneth, you look like a cheer. Eh? Ah, of course. <laughs> one in the right. making. Okay. Um, <laughs> Reverend Hayab, I'm sure you've been following developments, you know, happening in the country. And this is not the first time, you know, the peace talk, you know, has been on the table. But when we say negotiating peace for nation building, what readily just comes to your mind going by what is played out, or what is playing out in the country? Uh, thank you very much for having me. Let me begin by saying that for every conflict out there, it started because of the absence of dialogue. But at the end of the conflict, after damage has been done, you still have to come back to the table to dialogue. So when we look at negotiating peace for nation building, we are simply saying, look, there is need for us to have a conversation towards achieving a positive result. There is need for us to have a conversation towards understanding each other's better. 
there is need for us to have a conversation towards addressing things that can easily be misunderstood by citizens. There is a need for us to have a conversation towards helping citizens to appreciate certain things that they may not know or they know but they are viewing it differently. So negotiation and dialogue are two words that actually agree with one another because in negotiation we discuss about an issue towards achieving an M. In dialogue we have two or more people having a conversation towards understanding and helping each other to have the right thing to do and to address a situation or address whatever is before them. So Nigeria at this time really needs that negotiation because a large section of the country, let me say a particular demography of this country, is upset, is disturbed, is worried, and expressing that anger and that worry in such in a different way. Some view it violent. Some are saying, oh, let's just show ourselves so that they will know we are tired of things that are going on. So the need for government and those uh, and citizens to begin to dialogue, to begin to discuss, to say, hey, what exactly are the issues? What are the problems around? How do we find our way out? You can see they are discussing and then they are negotiating and say, okay, we can do it this way. After all, when we define democracy, democracy is nothing than simply government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Mm. So in democracy, what we do, even in the political setting of choosing a leader, is negotiation. Yeah. Uh, no, I yeah. want to come in now. Yeah, yes, uh, um, Reverend, I would want to know, you know, from your background or uh, from your foundation, you know, you said the Global Peace Foundation, Nigeria, promoting how one family under God campaign, you know, a value, you know, based peace building initiative. We want to know what exactly do you do in this foundation? Yeah, in Global Peace, what we do is to mitigate identity based conflict using our value based approach. Because in the first instance, we are dealing with human. And those we are dealing with, we must first agree that we are all human beings. Because you see, like we talk about dialogue, you don't dialogue with someone that you think you are above him. Mm -hmm. You don't dialogue without coming to the table with an open mind. Mm -hmm. You don't dialogue without coming to the table with respect for the other person. You don't dialogue without coming to the table to see the other person as if he do not fit to have a dialogue. When you do that, your dialogue has failed even from the first table. So from the first stage. So in dialogue, you come to the table to talk to someone that, okay, I want to listen to your part of the story. I want to understand where you are coming from. I want to understand what you think and why you do what you are doing. And I respect you. I'm going to give uh, my attention to what you're going to say, but also pay attention to what I'm going to say at the cost of this dialogue. So at Global Peace, we try to look at what are those human values that connect humanity. Okay, because uh, when we say we are talking about value-based peace approach, we are looking at those values that connect us irrespective of age, irrespective of tribe. religion, <coughs> irrespective of tribe, yeah. irrespective of region, irrespective of where you come from. Look, irrespective of all your professional background, there are values that binds human beings together. And so, because you are a doctor and I'm just a cleaner, do not make you higher than me. Yes, of course, it just gives you a different role from what I'm doing. Yeah, so yes. we are looking at values that unite, values that promote respect, love, acceptability, which is common, universal principles of love, forgiveness, tolerance. They are not restricted to one group of people. So at Global Peace, we do that. But one key message which I wanted to say before uh, I, I stop is the one family under God. What yes. do we mean by one family under God? From the Abrahamic religion, all these three religions agree with one account of creation, that all human beings come from one ancestral origin. So if you and my sister on the other side, we all come from one ancestral origin, but we're not of the same tribe, yes. neither we are of the same religion, we may not even come from the same region. So but we accept our common origin, respecting one another, listening to one another, then we can come to dialogue, we can come to negotiation, we can come to agreement, we can build a society where you belong, I belong, everybody belong, and together we march on. You know, you Thank just you. brought it out of me. I wanted you to tell us those values you were talking mm. about, and it's good you spelled it out. Um, you know, respect, love, sacrifice, and all of that. And I know one of the major goals for the foundation, you know, is promoting equitable 
um, system of governance and sustainable development now when all of these values you talked about is in place let's paint a picture for Nigeria um, when you look at you know what has played out what is playing out and the role every citizen is expected to play irrespective of your position whether you're in a place of leadership or you're just an ordinary citizen would you say we're having these values thrive among us well we are coming from a practice that seems to be giving a bad impression about the values uh, let me use something that is common to us in africa we come from the, the african concept of Ubuntu. Though it's not common in West mm -hmm. Africa, but it's something that virtually every African is aware that in Ubuntu concept we say you are because I am uh -huh. or I am because you uh -huh. are. Uh -huh. So it's like saying that government is about us and we are for government. So the people and government are not different. After all, it's from the people we choose leaders to lead us in government. <coughs> and it's from government we serve people. Uh -huh. So virtually those leading and those who are not in office all own uh -huh. government. Uh -huh. But I've always said this, and I want to say it with a sense of responsibility. That one of the biggest challenges is that people have not been trained to appreciate the culture of who is the government. Mm -hmm. We view government in a very wrong way in our mm -hmm. system. And it's not because it's what we all agree. It's because some few individuals want us to think it is like that. Government is about us. As I'm seated here and you're seated here, Nobody knows who is going to be the next governor, who is going to be the next president. So if I support this government to succeed, I'm not supporting this government, I'm supporting myself. Mm. If this government failed to deliver good, she did not fail to deliver good to me, she has failed to deliver the dividends of democracy to herself. Because the man who is governor today or president today may not be tomorrow. And those things we are asking him to do for us now, he will also face them tomorrow when he is out of power. So you can see both parties need to know that this thing called government is about us. It's not about some people. When people take ownership of their government, of the leadership of their country, then they no longer destroy anything because they know if they destroy anything, they're destroying what belongs to them. Uh, they no longer begin to see it from a negative point of view. Even if they see, they come to speak from the point of correction, not the point of destruction. And so those who are in government will also begin to understand that, look, when people say or hear their view and say, want us to do this, they are not asking us to leave our power office for them. They are simply asking us to do what all of us will be happy. So when governance is seen from that point of view, then everybody in the country, everybody in the nation bec becomes part and person of governance. Uh, I used to cite this example uh, with simple traffic light. You don't, you know, yes. the traffic light is just a machine out there. Yeah. It doesn't speak to you. But because we've agreed that we want orderliness in our traffic situation. Yes. When you drive and the yellow line light shows, you know that you need to slow down. Yeah. And when the red light shows, you know you need to stop. You're not stopping because you are afraid of the light. Exactly. You are stopping because you are consciously aware that if you move, if you continue, there may be an accident. Yes. And the accident is not about anything. It's a confusion that will lead to either you being injured or, or the hate. other person being injured. And there will be a traffic challenge with, because of your mistake. So to show patriotism and responsibility, to show obedience to the law, you stop. It doesn't make you a weak person. It doesn't make you someone who do not know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You stop. So when people have done this and know this, uh, what is the difference? So governance must be seen from all uh, aspects as our role, my role, the role of my son, the role of my wife, the role of my mom, the role of my father, the role of my neighbor, the role of the man in Aso Villa, the role of the man in Sakashi Ibrahim House, because I'm from Kaduna, so let me use our <laughs> government house here. So that's simply what it is. So any day, any time, the governor sees us as partners in progress, the president sees us as partners in progress, we also see him as first among equals. And in negotiating how we move together, we dialogue every day. There's something our governors are doing now that I like. I wish they've been doing that long ago. What they call the town hall meetings. Meeting. Where yeah. are you listening to? You tell us what you think our budget should be. And we say, sir, can't you just do the budget this way? Uh, try this this year and try this. Don't you see that your budget seems to be skewed this way? Can we come back this way? We are talking. We yeah. are negotiating. Okay. By the time he goes to the house and present the budget, we will say, that is our budget. Okay. okay, so that was yeah. if uh, you have even come to what I, you know, wanted to ask because you've mentioned, you know, dialogue, mm -hmm. you know, you know, as the, uh, the way to go. But uh, I'm 
asking uh, e now if we say we need peace in nigeria you know it's just to say the obvious but i want to know what um strategy would you advise you know for government to adopt you know when you look at dialogue now take for instance when these protests started you know we, we had it that okay we don't even know who are the organizers we don't know who to talk to so and as okay, government is saying okay come let's dialogue now you will find out that in some quarters people would say this dialogue does it really you know bear the fruit but now if you are to advise what strategy would you recommend you know in terms of dialogue, what type of dialogue? Is it going to the marketplace? Is it going to, to, to church leaders, religious leaders, traditional leaders? How do you advise government to go about this dialogue? Well, you see, government at every level must have a structure or mechanism of getting information. Okay. And in the information, they will be able to assess. It seems more people are saying, let there be rain, let there be rain, let there be rain. So the pains and the need of our people at this moment is addressing the issue of rain. And government can now say, oh, because I understand you are talking about rain. We are in government, but we want to know better what time should the rain fall. Okay. Can we get a representative from those of you talking about rain to speak for us or to come and educate us more? That is a way of dialoguing and negotiation. But when people are talking about rain, talking about rain, then you sit in power and say, no, they don't even understand. We're in dry season. Unfortunately for you, climate change has changed seasons now. Mm -hmm. It is no longer exactly what you're thinking. <laughs> so because those people complain about rain understand yeah. the season, understand the challenge of the moment. So what I'm simply saying is that dialogue takes place where there is trust. Okay. Dialogue takes place where there is tolerance. Dialogue takes place where there is humility. Dialogue takes place where there is respect. Those leading, respecting their citizens, tolerating and appreciating the contribution of their citizens, those, list, those leading, believing that they do not know all, and giving the citizens an opportunity to also add value to whatever decision that is going to take, then dialogue will come. Like when we begin to have the build up to all that led to the protests. Yes, it was true that the promoters and planners and sponsors of the protests did not come. Is that really what we wanted to? We have to look back. What happened? Why were they afraid to show their face? Because in the past, promot uh, promoters of either protests or whatever are actually being clamped down. Okay. And you know, the fear of showing up. And I've always said this, that our security agencies must deliberately have a connect with people, win the trust and confidence of the people. You know, there's this saying, everything that when you know something, say something. Mm. It is true, but people are not saying something because yeah. I'm afraid to say something when I'm not sure who am I telling something to. Mm. I'm afraid to say something because I feel when I say something, I instead protected. of addressing something, I will be the target. Mm. So everybody seems to be quiet. But when we have built confidence among people and say, look, we are an open government, we're listening. We are an open government willing to learn. We are an open government willing to understand. We are an open government willing to do what the people want. People will not be scared to show us that, look, oh, people are troubled about this, and they may react about this. Can we do something to stop the reaction? And they act upon it. And like those who work with government, part of the responsibility of those who have been appointed by governor, or appointed by president, appointed by a legislator or whatever, why do we have legislators? Because they sit to see every information and every action going on. Mm. And they quickly come and say, what do we, we need to do something because people are disenchanted with this or disenchanted with that. But the system we have at the moment doesn't really give that room. We have more people surrounding leaders as praise singers, even when things are wrong, they don't want to tell them. Right. And that's what I find was the missing link. Who trust who, who would have said what, that would have given room for negotiation before the protests. Okay, Reverend. Uh, um you know, what you just said, you know, brings us to this issue. Now, even, you know, days into the protest, um, the government came out and said, this is what we have done. This is what is expected in the long run, uh, for long term, rather. Mm -hmm. This is what is expected to yield result for the short term. Now, when um, government have come out to say, this is the part I have played, 
when we're saying we're negotiating through dialogue, like you just state, um, stated, um, strategic dialogue, what is expected of the government? Because um, governance, if I understand, it's a process. And if people want to see the dividends of democracy, there are calls for civic responsibility in order for us to build a nation of our dream, adhering to what the government has said. We must, nothing happens in a vacuum. Things build up and eventually take place. Before now, how and what are those things we've done to win the confidence and trust of the government? It is when we win the confidence and trust of the government that we want to stand together. Uh, I was in Kaduna in the week before uh, the protest, and uh, the governor called us for a town hall meeting from the Christian community to the Muslim leaders to civil society to Labour Congress and others. Uh, after listening to him, people just realized that, wait a minute, there's a point the man is raising. We don't need to take our state backward. We need to refuse to be part of this protest. Uh, I, I will say it without, uh, for, because Kaduna people agree with me. That's why the protest in Kaduna seems to be, yes, the protest did happen, but you'll also see like 50% of the state are not part of the protest. They're just living normal lives as if nothing is happening. Even in the site that there is protest, over 35% of the people are not part of the protest. The 15% that are part of the protest well, I don't want to join others to call them hoodlums. I prefer to say they were probably not well informed about the implication. Uh, did you look at the first day? The young children, you can't even tell me that they, were, they are mature to look for jobs. So what were they doing? Probably they have been misled by someone to believe in that they are fighting yes. something yes. that they do not know about. And even those who keep coming and eventually led to the curfew, uh, which is something you have to praise the governor for taking a proactive uh, step to ensure that the whole thing do not escalate. Uh, you can see that there is, where the gap is, then you know, okay, now you have this group you want to deal with. You did say something which is true. Government came out and said this. But you see, because we are partners in progress, it's need for us to be honest with our government to help us succeed. If we come and don't tell government what exactly we think didn't go right, we've not helped us at all. One error or one area we assume led to the lapses is that there were too many voices from government. The many voices we are not saying the same thing. Some voices are asking for dialogue. Some voices are, accusing, are pointing accusing fingers. And you know already tension has been gathered. People are upset. There's a way you win people. As a peace practitioner or expert, I need to tell my government that look, at that time, what some of us thought would have happened is those other voices would have gone low give room for our boss, the man we've given him mandate, to pacify the people. If we're going to speak for him, let's speak the language he will say, not our own language. There were a lot of misconceptions out there, whether they were true or false. Those things were not properly managed or refuted because we live in a world of propaganda. And when one issue comes out and people begin to say this, because when you go to social media now, what you will find is that they will say, yes, he said, let us dialogue, but this one said this about us, this one said this about us, this one said this about us. So we're advising those who work closely to power that please don't make things complicated. The president is open to dialogue. The president, in his speech, and I quote, openly said that I acknowledge your pains and grievances. Mm -hmm. But you see, because those other people, no one really come out to shut them down and say, hey, this thing you say, whether it is me, you are misquoted or not, is not the position of government. So it just makes those who are enemies of state or those who are angry to now hide under it and say, well, they are just playing game with you. They are not serious. If they are serious, why? This, uh, it's a double talk. talk. They say this and they are saying this. So are we dialoguing or oh, we are criminals? Are we dialoguing or oh, we are idiots? These are words that leaders must deliberately find a way not to say it in future experience of Nigeria. Our president was magnanimous. Our president was fatherly. But was everything around the whole conversation the same? I will not say yes here because okay. if I say other Nigerians will assume I'm not also speaking the truth because okay. at least as a person, I saw it and I just shoot, shook my head and say I wish someone would tell those ones to mellow down their voice. Okay, Reverend Hayab, um, you've said a lot, you know, that one will have to ponder on, mm -hmm. you know, even if you're not in position. Yes. Uh, but we have um, NGOs like the Global Peace Foundation Nigeria, 
you know we have civil society groups we have religious leaders we have community leaders I'm getting to the point of community engagement because I believe family or society is made, made up of smaller units you know of family now we all have responsibilities whether we like it or not this is our country and we don't have anywhere to go so we cannot begin to stand in the divide and say let things fall apart and just fold our arms and watch now throwing it back to the stakeholders i just mentioned what role you know would you say rather you're satisfied with the role they're playing are they doing enough to bring the people closer to listen okay let me begin by saying that at global peace we have a unit called the global peace women and the Global Peace Women, the message they preach is peace begin in the home. Okay. There is a place of teaching morals in the home that seems to be lacking because of so many things. And most times our effort towards encouraging negotiations and dialogue centered on people in the urban city or the big names. Unfortunately, those that will be recruited to go on the street to protest don't belong to these big names yeah. and there is no concrete effort or structure put in place to reach those in the grassroots because after all who are the ones crying about food yes. the people at the grassroots yes. so when you ask me as somebody i would say yes one thing we need to have done and we should continue to do is promoting and building the culture of peace in the home i'll give you a simple illustration when we meet with top religious leaders, top civil society people, either in the villa or in a big hotel in Abuja, and get NTA to beam that program live. Yes, in our thinking, a larger percentage of Nigerians have watched us, but we have not yet remembered that there is a large chunk of Nigeria who have no access to life, so they didn't watch the program. They have no access to life, so they didn't even listen to the radio program. They have no access to life, so they didn't know exactly what we discussed. And if you have an enemy, what he will do is that, okay, since they are targeting some class of people, we'll go to the other people that they don't care about them and remind them that, you know, you didn't eat food yes. today. <laughs> you right. didn't eat food because of this. So how do we engage people from the grassroots and help them see this is what government is doing, this is the effort government is doing. So we need to introduce that. The Nigerian government have a, an important institution called the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Mm -hmm. I wish and I want to recommend that that institution must be engaged and engaged deliberately so that she will go beyond the bigger picture, uh, thing we do in the urban setting into rural engagement, building capacity of rural women, rural youth, rural faith leaders and community leaders to understand nation building, to appreciate nation building. If we want to see Nigerians mm. appreciating us, we must take our peace work to rural communities okay. yes uh, reverend that brings me to you know you are a clergy and out there there is a belief that some you know a clergy of different faith you know sometimes use religion or some leaders out of maybe their selfish uh, interest use the religion to you know divide the people more I don't know if you, uh, with your experience, you know, working with interfaith and working with communities, I, I, I wouldn't know if you have, uh, if you have found this uh, a belief to be correct. Then uh, how do we go about? How do we nip it in the bud? How do we solve? It? How do we address it? Because uh, from what you've just said, that the grassroots, those in the grassroots, they need correct information. So if they are not getting the correct information, they will not be, you know, willing. You know, to be part of this crusade to build our nation. Okay, you Reverend, see? just before you pick up with that answer, we have to take a break. So I need you to ponder on the thoughts. We'll take a break now. We're back. Please don't go anywhere. Nigeria, a land of rich culture and diverse voices, where every voice matters. In times of disagreement, let's choose dialogue over discord. Together, we can find solutions through understanding and respect. Let's build a stronger Nigeria, one conversation at a time. Dialogue, not protest. Unity, not division. Nigeria, united in dialogue. MFA for Digital Literacy is 
a bot that you can use, you can interact to learn more about digital literacy. Hello, it's our pleasure to have you join us on platform. I'm Ruth Aguela. What is the yardstick for measuring everybody's moral integrity? It's critical at this point in time. How daunting has that been for the Institute when getting them abreast with all the legislative procedures? The fact remains that one training workshop is not enough. Glad to know you're there. Thank you for staying tuned. The conversation is negotiating peace for nation building. Reverend um, Kenneth asked a question on the role of religious leaders, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, you know, being agents of change and carrying the people along, especially at the grassroots. So you want to respond? Uh, one of the reasons why the global peace is promoting what she calls the community peace building initiative is because of the question you've asked. Mm. We realize that peace building is structured in such a way that it disenfranchises a large number of Nigerians and a large number of people. When you bring, let's say, 100 people to a hotel in Abuja and keep them for four nights or for five nights and you ask them to sign agreements, the larger people there did not even know mm. about them. You're right. Uh, have you also observed that sometimes the process of invitation they are only inviting friends and people who they care about to come and they sign agreements that the people do not have. And that's why in some communities in Nigeria, you've seen NGOs working with them and they say they sign agreement. And after a week, the agreement ceases to be agreement because they actually just collected some friends and uh, people they care about to bring them to a city, lodge them in a fine hotel, they eat fine food. And in the euphoria of that <laughs> new food, they sign what they don't know. Do the people out there know about it? Do the people out there appreciate this effort? So our peace building, community peace building initiative is a process where we take the process to the community. The community, through their gatekeepers, nominate those who will get engaged in the conversation. And those engaged in the conversation don't take it as their own. Mm. They are only representative of the people, and then they come back to the larger people to report the gains of their training, the knowledge they have acquired, the needs and the situation they think they can apply what they have acquired to address in their community. If you have a grab of the community, but they are buy-in, their willingness to go with the message, if that faith leader comes back to tell them something negative, they say, sir, but even last month we were together with you and this is what we understand. So, there must be a deliberate effort in putting structures at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. But Inanim's question is how to nip that perception yes. society has. No, 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 no. Because, because, uh, you know, because, because the difference between perception yes, and then, sir, I have acknowledged you, that it is true is not just a yeah. perception. Sir, before so, you continue, okay, right. I, I would also want you to, you know, talk to, you know, you know, for how it divides the people the more. Because you are talking of dialogue, mm -hmm. you understand? When two different faiths, could not come together, could not understand each other. You, you, you know that it will be difficult for dialogue to take place in such you know, scenario or such situation. You have to begin to form structures in and local communities. communities the Give people opportunity for community engagement, knowing who they are talking to, knowing who is talking for them, knowing what are the issues we are discussing about, not having someone who they do not even know but mm. claim to have represented them. Yeah. And then I also wanted to be sure I'm clear to say that it is not just a perception. It is a reality that we do have some selfish faith leaders who go to communities to instigate people because we must acknowledge a problem before we prefer solutions. Yes, when we say, no, it does not exist no. just because we want to be we're nice guys, denier. it's there. So yes. you, then you cannot apply any medication to it. So that do exist from all the faith, from all the ethnic nationalities, from all the different groups because some people actually are conflict entrepreneurs. What they do is that they take advantage of what is happening okay. to enrich That's themselves right. and oh to attract attention to themselves so that now they will call upon. Mm -hmm. So what we do is that we say, okay, you can still have your evil agenda, but we have a way of helping to dislodge 
that evil agenda. And how do we do it? We come to you, but we go to you, to the people. We want the people to know what it means to live together. We want the people to know what it means to dialogue with others. We want the people to know what it means to negotiate towards finding solutions. We want the people to see it as their own. Once we've achieved that, the other pastor or imam who will now go with a negative message will no longer have a market to okay, sell. Okay, Reverend Hayab, mm. just to hold your thoughts there. That is on one aspect for the Global Peace Foundation, Nigeria. Yes, we have other groups, we have mm. other civil groups, you know, civil rights groups that can also lend their voices. What would be your message or plea rather, you know, to help strengthen the capacity you're trying to build at mm. a community level? What would you say, you know, to different sections? Um, community leaders are not left out. What is your plea? To the NGOs, I would say, the job of community development or development work is not a competitive work. Hmm. It's a collaborative work. Most errors I have seen that we do in the civil society is we keep going to one group of people. We keep calling the same group of people for our training. Ten groups will come in ten years dealing with the same people. Why don't we have a structure, an understanding where, oh, there is a community in Kaduna called Gefe in Adara land. There's another community in Kaduna called Marabon Rido in Bagi land. So James or group A go to this, group B go to this. And then we begin to work in all those 10 or 20 or 50 communities sharing the same message and building people. We will be able to see the synergy and the connect. But once we just concentrate on one group, we end up repeating and repeating, repeating. I was in training recently, and we all agree as civil society that that's all one mistake we are making. Emphasizing on one group, like now if there's a problem in Bori, we all want to go to Bori, not knowing that, oh, when others are already treating Bori, let's quickly think of this. If we take care of Bori and do not take care of Kuboa, another problem can come. Mm -hmm. yes. So another group should go, go to, to Kuboa and start building structures in Kuboa so that we don't even have the situation in Bori yeah. before we come back. And that's where I earlier in my presentation said, the Nigerian government have an institute called the Institute for Peace and Conflict yes. Resolution. I want to recommend that our government must empower her, must structure her. The fact that recently we are told that they're in the issue of merger, they want to merge. I said, no, if government would have listened to plea, that group supposed to work closely with the National Security Advisors Office, working with different NGOs to stabilize situation. Um, putting her with the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'm not sure the connect is really very clear. Such will work. And state governments are doing something good. In many of the states in Nigeria now, they have what they call the peace agency. Plateau State have a Plateau State Peace Agency. Kaduna State have they call what they call Kaduna Peace Commission. And every state. So all those structures of government can engage the NGOs that are working in their state and begin to diversify their approach, areas of influence. Then we come to the issue of stakeholders we are talking about. Honestly speaking, the role of every stakeholder is to build, is to help promote, is to help encourage, is to help stabilize that community. Whether he's coming as a traditional ruler, he's coming as a faith leader, he's coming as a youth leader, he's coming as a woman leader, or whatever structure that is in place. Uh, we do discuss this in our training and talk about common people and uh, unique people or special people. And we tell people that in some community, the man who matters is not the senator. It's likely the man who takes care of their bike. Because 80% of the young people use bike, exactly. so they come to the bike, uh, the bike repairer, yes. if there's anything like the mechanic, to work on that. How do we capitalize on who do people run to and build his capacity so that when people bring their bikes for repair or bicycle for repair, he speaks That's words that change their heart from violence to peace. So we mm. must definitely mm. put such structures. If as a pastor or as a cleric, I fell in building unity, in building understanding, then I have painted my role as a cleric and the faith I represent in bad light. So faith leaders are doing their work, but you know, Nigeria is a, such a large country, we must all acknowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we assume that you can do all in yeah. one day, it's not possible. Okay. So we need to diversify and also improve more structures that will take. I don't want to blame NGOs, probably their donors insist and say, this is where I want you to go. Mm -hmm. We can only offer advice. Okay, that, Reverend. Yeah, we do it differently. Reverend, mm -hmm. uh, you know you mentioned the youths earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you know they are being deployed whenever there is um, crisis. You know to perpetrate some of these evil acts. 
that's the issue of youth restiveness. And experts have come out to say, let's engage our youths, you know, because they play a significant role, or rather they're the driving force for development. What's your thoughts, you know, on ways of engaging youths positively to become useful to themselves? If you watch scenarios that has played out during this protest, it's appalling to even see children who don't even understand, like you stated, who don't even understand what, they're, what is happening or what they're getting into. And they're just allowing them waste their future by being part of vandalism we saw happen in some parts of the northern states. When we monitor what happened the last six, seven days, and so the way young men came out and were voicing out, at Global Peace, we've come up with a program, and we're going to start it in just one week from now, where we target and find youth voices for peace. Uh, youth need to see their voices being heard when it comes to the issue of peace. I think in many of our cultures, even in our religious places, we've not done enough in amplifying voices of youth on issues of development, on issues of national building, on issues of progress. We sometimes culturally say, this is not it's children's not talk. Enough. This is elders' talk. You see, when they don't seem to understand that their voice has been heard, the chances is that they get angry and then they find a way to get their voices heard. As a pastor, I've always cited this example. The Bible says that when a demon or when demons are cast out of a man, it is expected that something must replace the demon. If the demon goes away and come back and realize that the heart that he was cast out is empty, he will not enter. He will go and bring, bring seven. seven more powerful <laughs> demons. demons. So that the situation of the man at the moment will be worse Most than the first people. one. Many times when we bring our young men as if we are casting out demons from them, we don't fill it with something. We don't give them opportunity to express themselves. We don't give them opportunity to do something to show that that demon we ask to go out of you, whether it's a demon of laziness, it's a demon of destruction, it's a demon of gossip or propaganda or saying things that we, we cast that demon out, but we left the heart empty. And so when the demon comes back and realizes, okay, they have stopped me from tormenting this young man, but they are not giving him anything to do. So he will go and bring several more demons so that they will come and torment him or use him to do more havoc. So the youth needs opportunity, not just rhetoric opportunity, mm -hmm. concrete opportunities, whether for study, for skills, for work, for engagement. They need that. They need to feel they belong. We have what we call in Nigeria the National uh, uh, Directorate of Employment. Mm -hmm. Many times the adverts are there, but are we really sure that the youth are, get engaged? And there's something we must speak to our leaders that we should correct. A situation where only youths who have connection get opportunities. Only for that trigger pains and anger in the heart of the other youth. But when we make it, it is merit and who applies. Youths will be happy. Youth will, if anybody even come and want to instigate them, they will say, wait a minute. My brother is where he is. Nobody gave him any connection. But when they realize that they cannot get it until they know someone, and unfortunately they know nobody. So okay. such situation further make youth feel. So I want to just encourage that. Get youth involved. Amplify their voices. Let them see that what they are being told is what they see happening. Let people okay. see them in the forefront of the change they want to happen. Reverend. Then other youth will say, no, I won't join you in evil because I can see my friend progressing and I want to be like you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Still talking about the young people, you know, I also have seen that you also, you are an advocate of, you know, young girls, adolescents, and they're saying that when you train a girl child, you have trained a nation. Now, I want to know what have you been able to achieve in, uh, in this regard, in looking at, you know, some situations where the young girls are, you know, for victim of uh, um, abuses of all kinds. Have you been able to maybe secure litigation or what have you been doing and what have been your challenges? When I got involved with the project called Collective Action for Adolescent Girls Initiative, we focus on three E's, early marriage, education, and empowerment. Okay. Especially in the north and in the state I come from. I did say this and I spoke extensively to the extent that I was called to uh, New York in one of the commission for the status of women to speak about this experience. And I told them, we 
have not been able to address the issue of girl child in Nigeria because a good number of us live in denial. Okay. Either we say it is not happening, but it's happening every day. As a pastor, I'm listening to my colleague pastors who feel, yeah, the issue of lack of education for girl child, lack of empowerment for girl child and early marriage, is not happening in our culture. It's not happening in our church. And I just say, wait a minute. Can you really be honest with yourself? Just check the number of the matters in the rural area. Those who understand how to understand what I mean by matter, the women fellowship. Mm. You'll find out that almost 80% of what constitutes women fellowship in most of our rural area are under age girls. And so they're already married. Can we be honest and accept that there's a problem? And that's why these young girls are themselves babies, giving birth to babies. Mm. So when we begin to address that, we will change. And then we look at the other side of it, the issue of hawking. We saw, yes, it is used as a way of empowerment, but in reality, it only exposes those girls to danger. Yeah, exactly. So why don't we empower them in such a way that they will have skills and do something positive and it will not expose them to danger like the one done by hawking? I used to drive along this road to Kaduna every time. Uh, when you come by the toll gate, you have a lot of trucks. When you go and see the young girls who cook food very early in the morning to go and sell to those truck drivers, and then the truck drivers take advantage of them, you will not wish your daughter to be. So what you don't want your daughter to be, never wish another person's daughter to be, because if that character impregnate the girl and run away, that boy will become part of those that can easily be used to hijack or cause mayhem during violence. Mm -hmm. So we want girls to properly be trained and grow health wise before they marry so that they will be able to contribute positively to society. They will tell their children what is good, what is bad, and they have skills. So that's why I say we're dealing with three E's. We're talking about early okay. marriage. marriage. How do we stop that early marriage? We're dealing with education. How do we encourage them? Look, we even encourage parents to say, even if the girl make mistake and got impregnated okay. before let's not stop her education okay let's own up to certain challenge and correct it she may be one out of 20 yeah. so let's correct so that we don't have one gap and then we talk about empowerment we introduce them to skills to so many things and when we brought their parents then their parents said we didn't think this one was going to work Reverend Hayab, we're running out of time mm. and to you know um, look at everything that has been said. It's a continuous dialogue. But I want to hear your final thoughts. Um, they said charity begins at home. And we, wherever this whole situation leads us, it takes us back to value, family values, the homes we come out from. It tells of who we become in society. Going forward as a way of preferring solution as we round up this conversation, um, what are you? What is your message, Reverend, especially to every section, every every everyone? This is what Nigerians have gone through in the past one week: the pains, the destruction, the protests, the response by government, the perception, and all that has happened. I want to sincerely plead with this group of people: one, parents. As a father and a mother, you have the primary responsibility to bring up your child in a godly way. As a Christian pastor, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he will grow. When he grows old, he will not depart from it. Train your child to respect the law of the land. Train your child not to join people who destroy. Train your child to love and respect others. If people come and want to recruit him or instigate him into violence, Train your child to know where to draw the line and say, no, I didn't get this from my parents. Oh, I need to discuss this with my mother and my father. When we have children who will say, no, I will not join you until I get approval of my parents, we are winning. As religious leaders, we must preach and preach nothing but love, nothing but peace, nothing but unity, nothing but togetherness, because if we divide people hiding under religion, Tell me what's going to happen when they meet in eternity where you are telling them they will go. Will they reject their neighbor there because they disagree when they were in Nigeria street? So people must learn to love one another. My Bible teaches me, and I want to say it, that if you claim to love God but hate your fellow human being, you are a liar. You can't love God until you love human beings, until you love the people around you. I want to speak also to civil society that we have a responsibility in helping this country. It is not enough for us to say we are preaching peace and running programs and saying huge amount have been spent. Because I was speaking to a donor agency the other day and I said, I don't understand where you have been donating for 15, 20 years. And they are still telling you the same story 15 years later. And you just, 
Let our work not be right. report writing. Let it impact people's lives. Let it transform people's lives. Let it make people begin to see the world from a different view or different lens than the one they saw in the past and they were segregating. All and right. last but not the least, I want to plead to our leaders. Governance is about people. Don't allow the pressure of office. Don't allow the voices around you to All confuse right. you. Remember where you're coming. Together we can make this country great. And I can tell you, I have no other place that I'm proud of like Nigeria because in Nigeria... I, am, I have liberty, I have f brothers, I have friends, I have neighbors, All and right. I have a culture that I Reverend choose. Hayab, we'll leave the conversation there. If I allow you, you just keep going on. And that's the passion I see. Yeah. And that's one way we can advance understanding, tolerance, solidarity. That's the whole essence of peace building. Exactly. Thank you so much, Reverend John Hayab. He's the country me. director, Global Peace Foundation, Nigeria. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us and keep up the good work. Thank you, Reverend. We'll continue to pray for our country, Nigeria. Kenneth Inanim, thank you so much for your contribution on platform. Thank you, Ruth. It's my pleasure. All right. The conversation has been on negotiating peace for nation building. I'll just leave you with these thoughts. Peace is the only asset we have. And conflict on the other side is a threat to that peace. Let us choose wisely. I'm Ruth Aguilera.